In this lecture, we're looking at Calvin, England, and Scotland as we seek to determine how Calvin began to exert some influence onto these other regions as the Reformation began to take root there, and as we'll see, how he was eventually turned away while he was embraced in Scotland. And the purpose of this lecture is really to have a case study of the kinds of ways in which the Reformation would intermingle with itself. The way there would be, on the one hand, a group of people who would embrace the ideas of one reformer, while in the other case, either the response would be muted or it would be outright hostility. And we should be clear at the outset that England and Scotland were never at the forefront of Calvin's mind. Rather, it was France that was always occupying his attention whenever he was not exclusively focused on Geneva. France obviously being his home country, and more importantly, as the years wore on, and as Calvin got closer and closer to the end of his life, the Reformation in France became more hostile, and this would eventually culminate after Calvin's death in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and the French Wars of Religion. There were a number of French Reformed folks, or French Calvinists, people that we today know as the Huguenots, and they were zealously committed to the Reformed faith, and they supported it entirely. The issue, though, is that in France, the Huguenots eventually get stomped out. They either flee or they conform during the 16th and 17th centuries. And besides that, it is the English-speaking world that really carries on the legacy of the Reformed tradition, as they would call it, as Calvinism with the rise of Puritanism in England, and then as the Puritans fled to the New World, and then in particular as the Scottish became overwhelmingly Reformed and formed the early version of the Presbyterian Church, which itself moved to the New World and took root. What we're seeing here is that the English-speaking worlds have a substantial interaction with Calvin in particular. But as we'll see in this lecture, often what is going on here is that there are various people that are using the name of Calvin to achieve their own political, theological, or ecclesiological goals. And in not a few cases, Calvin was caught off guard by the way in which his name was either cherished or thrown into the mud as a result of his followers or those who were reformed using him as a cudgel to beat somebody else up with. But we do want to say that France is what Calvin is most focused on. In fact, for the majority of the English Reformation, and the Scottish Reformation really doesn't get going until Calvin has nearly passed away, but for the majority of the English Reformation, Calvin really has no clue as to what's going on up there. He's drawn into a few connections, or in a few cases he's used as support for a fight that's going on in England. But the main Reformed voice for most of Calvin's life in England is not Bootser, and it's not Geneva, it's not Calvin, but rather it's Bullinger. In Zurich. Historians today talk extensively about what they call the Zurich Connection. This connection between Bullinger in particular, as well as a number of others. And they've noticed that Bullinger is just preoccupied at times with the Reformation, first in England and then in other countries. Bullinger is the one who really wants the Reform movement to go international. And he's able to do that in part because he has such a secure location there in the city of Zurich and because he is so well-respected in his lifetime. Calvin, by contrast, is under fire. He's having a hard go at reforming the city of Geneva, not only due to the resistance of the magistrates, but also due simply to the complexities of his region, with so many French foreign speakers coming to the Swiss regions and the natural animosity between the French-speaking Swiss and these newcomers to their scene. So for the majority of Calvin's life, he's actually really a secondary player in something as complex as the English Reformation. Not only that, but the English Reformation is a real enigma when it comes to Protestantism. The English Reformation does not get going in the same way, and it certainly doesn't get going with the same ferocity as the Reformation does in places like Switzerland or in Germany. No, the English Reformation gets going, as many of us know, because the king had a scruple of conscience. Henry VIII, still one of the most beloved kings in English history, and certainly one of the most well-known. The man who had six wives, the man who, according to popular misconception, killed five of them when only two were put to death. One died, one was divorced, and one survived him. But Henry VIII is the enigma of the beginning of the English Reformation. If you were to cast about for a country that would be considered 
perhaps the most Catholic country just prior to the Reformation, England would be either at the very top or it would be number one in terms of the most Catholic, the most rigorous country in terms of its fidelity to the papacy. A lot of this has to do with the fact that the Tudor dynasty, begun by Henry VIII's father, Henry VII, was a usurping power. It was not actually the natural claimant to the throne. Henry VII at the Battle of Bosworth, the scene that is famously depicted by Shakespeare in Richard III, where Richard III falling from his horse, he, the crowned king of England, calling out loud for, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Well, the man he's seeking to get away from is Henry VII, Henry VIII's father. And Henry VII and his son, by extension, Henry VIII, were enormously supportive and tied in to the Roman Catholic Church. They needed the papal support, in other words, to buttress their own claim to the throne. Not only that, but a lot of the corruptions and the problems that you see in places like the Netherlands or in Germany or in Switzerland are not prevalent or not as prevalent in England. England had good leadership, backed and supported by Henry VIII, and theologically and organizationally, the English church was as strong as you could imagine. In fact, when Luther's Reformation got underway, Henry VIII himself sat down to write a theological treatise against the man, writing his defense of the seven sacraments, challenging Luther for reducing the sacraments to only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And for his work in this, Henry VIII was given a title by the Pope in honor of his defense of Catholicism. And it's a title that is still used to this day by the Queen, and it is the title Defender of the Faith. Well, naturally the question is, what happened? Well, no children happened, or at least no male children happened for Henry, with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. They, of course, had a daughter, Mary, who we'll see in a minute, but they had no male sons, and given the tenuous grasp of the throne that Henry and the Tudor dynasty had at this point, a male heir was what he sought. And when the Pope refused to give an annulment, not least because Catherine of Aragon, his wife, was the aunt to Charles V, and Charles V, of course, being Holy Roman Emperor, was not about to allow his aunt to be cast aside. Well, when the Pope refused, Henry went his own way. And the change in Henry in terms of seeing himself now as head of the church, no longer the Pope, but Henry, the king, is head of the church, almost in a theonomic sense, a Davidic sense, to conjure up the imagery of the Old Testament. Henry sees himself as David or Solomon, or one of these great Old Testament leaders who is over the temple as well as over the commonwealth of Israel. Well, this change in Henry is so dramatic that historians have actually called it a conversion. He's not converted to the Protestant faith, but he's converted to some alternative faith that is quasi-Catholic, somewhat high church. It has the seven sacraments. It keeps so many of the essential elements in terms of worship and practice that are Roman Catholic. But it denies the very foundation upon which they're built, namely the papal authority and the authority of councils. Well, essentially, it's that little door crack slightly opening for the Protestants, the very few Protestants, by the way, who begin to ingratiate themselves with the king. They begin to become closer with him, and, proving the old adage that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Henry began to embrace them. Henry had appointed Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell, both evangelicals, to head both the church with Cranmer as Archbishop of Canterbury, as well as the state with Thomas Cromwell as vicegerent, sort of a vice ruler, someone who answers to the king, but yet who has power delegated to him to enact all kinds of things in the state. Well, obviously that's rocky soil to begin a reformation. A king wants an heir, he throws the pope out, and he gets in bed with the Protestants. Well, the curious thing of all of this is that Henry really didn't take much consideration into the education of his son, Edward. And because the Protestants were right there snuggled up beside Henry, they somehow managed to convince Henry that a good humanist education was best instilled in his young son, Edward, by Protestants like them. And so Edward was educated and nourished from a very young age on biblical faith and on the essential Protestant doctrines of the Reformation. And so when Henry died in 1547, lo and behold, Edward comes to the throne 
Now, the challenge here is that during Edward's reign, he was still just a minor, just a boy. He could not take the throne and the full power to himself until he reached the age of 18. And so, in his place, there ruled a council, the Privy Council. And these were a group of people who were appointed essentially by Henry, though there was a bit of a coup there at the end when Henry was on his deathbed. Almost overnight, you go from Henry, who is pumping the brakes as hard as he can to keep England from becoming Protestant, to now you have a King Edward, age nine, who, by all accounts, is thoroughly Protestant. In fact, all the way through the rest of his life, until he dies young, all signs point to the fact that he was going to be a Protestant king. But while we're waiting for him to come to his maturity, the Privy Council, those ruling on behalf of him, are entirely evangelical. And it's at this strange point, first of all, that England begins to become significantly more Protestant. All the remaining monasteries that were not closed under Henry were closed under Edward. The entire fabric of the Catholic Church in terms of the institutional church was just ripped apart. Their money was confiscated, and those who were part of the clergy or part of the monastic orders were churned out, not a few of them fleeing to the continent. Well, it's also at this time when the Reformed faith, in Calvin as well, begins to sync up with the English Reformation. What had until now been essentially a political reformation from the top down, now began to open much more widely. Cranmer himself, as recent research has shown, was not Anglo-Catholic or some kind of high churchman. Rather, he was consorting with all kinds of Protestants. If there is any hesitation in Cranmer, it's the fact that what they're doing is a political reformation. It's not, in fact, unlike what's happening in Geneva. You have the magistrates or the political rulers that are enforcing and supporting the Reformation, while those at the lay level, and this is particularly the case in England, do not want the Protestant faith. Well, what Cramer does is he begins to reach out to Reformed people, as well as to Melanchthon. He invites up Peter Martyr and Bootser, both of whom we've seen before, and they both agree. Peter Martyr takes a theology chair at Oxford, and Bootser teaches theology at Cambridge. And Bootser hated it. He thought it was too cold. He thought the food was awful. And he actually died, and he's buried in Cambridge at St. Mary's Church. Well, because of this, Bullinger and other Reformed folks from the Swiss regions take an enormous interest in England. They begin to correspond significantly. And in fact, it's at this point that Bullinger pushes Calvin more, yet again, to the forefront. And he has Calvin send a letter to the new king, Edward. And Calvin does. He reaches out, he commends him on the Reformation, and he encourages him to continue to do so. Well, by and large, that's all Calvin contributes to the English Reformation for this point. But it would be wrong to believe that the Reformed folks from the Swiss regions are not having an effect on the English Reformation. They're certainly not guiding it or governing it. The English Reformation folks are not swallowing Reformed theology whole, but rather they are being influenced by this. And so, the Book of Common Prayer twice is released, and the Book of Common Prayer is essentially a liturgy for just about everything in the Anglican services. It includes not only the worship service itself, as well as things like marriage and funerals, but it also includes morning and evening prayer. And Cramer released two of these in succession. And the problem here is that people try to figure out what Cramer's intentions are, and in the past, it was assumed that Cramer was not really Protestant because the prayer books don't go fully Protestant. The first one is certainly Protestant enough. It only has two sacraments. There is no reference to penance or any of these kinds of things. I mean, the first prayer book was Protestant enough that there were two Catholic riots, two major Catholic riots in 1549 when it was released because they, the Catholics, knew that this was a Protestant document. But when you compare the first Book of Common Prayer with the Reformations going on either in Germany or in Switzerland, it was really only, say, 60% of the way there. Well, what's Cramer doing? He's spoon-feeding the Reformation to those in the churches throughout England. His attempt is to get them praying as Protestants and worshiping as Protestants before he actually tries to impose or conform them to a Protestant confession. And this is seen very clearly because in the second edition, the 1552 edition of the prayer book, Cramer goes even farther. He applies more pressure and makes it more overtly Protestant. 
Well, all this comes to a head when Edward dies, we think of tuberculosis. And it was 1553, which is right when Calvin is at the height of his powers. And the Protestants attempted a coup. It's the Lady Jane Grey conspiracy. They attempted to place someone else on the throne. But there were two more children of Henry. There was Mary, the daughter from his first marriage. And there was Elizabeth, the daughter from his second marriage to Anne Boleyn. Well, in the end of 1553, Mary herself takes the throne. Now, question. If you're the daughter of Henry's Catholic queen, his first wife, and you were rightful heir, at least to some extent, you were the rightful princess, and you saw your father cast aside your mother, ruin the church, and then declare you to be a bastard, do you think you're going to be very much Protestant? <laughs> no. Mary was not Protestant. Mary Tudor was devoutly Catholic. She saw her mother as a martyr, and as a result, when she came to the throne in 1553, she sought both the persecution and suppression of Protestantism within England, which was still only relatively new, as well as the restoration of the English church to the Catholic fold, which she does accomplish. And it's during Mary's reign that a lot of the complexity between England and the Reformed world comes to a head. A number of Protestants flee from England, about a thousand of them, as many as 300, are eventually rounded up and executed by burning. Well, when those folks scatter, it's called the Marian Exile. When these folks scatter, the majority of them land in Protestant areas. And so what happens is a relationship that was more distant, more cordial, and based on a modicum of influence, now becomes more or less tied up together because all of these English Protestants, who would eventually return to reestablish the Anglican Church, now live and worship in the context of the Reformed world. Now get this right, this is not the first time they're connecting with the Reformed folks. This is rather the culmination of their connection as a result of the persecutions under Mary. Well, it's that exile that propels John Knox, as well as several others, into the context of not only Bootser and Bullinger, but in particular Calvin. And there's a famous fight that goes on, it's called the Troubles at Frankfurt. And these occur in 1555. What happens here is, with Knox as pastor in the city of Frankfurt and other English reformers and English bishops, former bishops, in other cities, there was no consensus as to whether or not they needed to continue using the prayer book, though virtually all of them agreed that it was not fully reformed and fully purged of some of the influence or some of the interpretations that Catholics had on it. Should they use that book or should they use other liturgies and forms of worship that they found in the cities that they lived in? Well, the fight in 1555 is massive because John Knox and a couple of his former colleagues get into it because Knox is more than willing to throw the Book of Common Prayer out. The problem, though, is the other evangelicals, the other Protestants from England, thought this was both indelicate and a real slap in the face to people like Cramer and others who were back in England in prison, and a number of whom had been burned at the stake. In other words, the Book of Common Prayer becomes a touchstone as people divide between the opinion of whether or not you can continue on the Reformation and start over, or should you, out of faithfulness and loyalty to your friends back home suffering, continue to use the Book of Common Prayer? Well, the fight is resolved because Knox is eventually kicked out of Frankfurt. <laughs> but he's not kicked out over liturgy. Knox at this time began to espouse some ideas that were a bit kooky for the 16th century. And they were that he believed that it was okay, that it was possible to kill and overthrow a monarch. Now, he doesn't get there quickly. Well, the city of Frankfurt is under the Holy Roman Empire, and as a result, Knox gets immediately booted out. They don't want to bring the fire down on their own heads. Well, Knox and some others go down to Geneva, and they buddy up with Calvin. Now, Calvin is relatively unaware. He is consulted at one point on the Book of Common Prayer fight, but it's not his fight. He's not getting involved. Rather, he wants to support those who are in exile down in his regions, and in particular in his city of Geneva. Well, it's there in Geneva that Knox becomes a full devotee of the Reformed liturgy and the structures that he experienced there. And so, in 1560, when he goes back to Scotland, and he and some others, through a series of complex events, take over the nation of Scotland, it is then fully Reformed, and it becomes, as a result of Knox's 
deep drinking of the Reformed faith, a real outpost, you might say, a real deep reservoir of Reformed thinking outside of the Swiss cantons. And it's for that reason that Presbyterianism, which comes from Scotland, is so committed to the Reformed side of things. It's also very committed to Calvin. It was because Knox himself, who had come from England initially, though he was himself Scottish, he was a priest in England under Edward, but when he fled, he found the theology and the Reformation that he wanted, and that is what he and others instilled in Scotland. And it's for that reason that to this day, those who identify as Presbyterian have the kind of twin focus, a twin loyalty to the Scottish Reformation as well as to the Swiss Reformation. It's because Knox and others really leveraged Calvin and the Reformed name when they were reforming the church in Scotland. Well, what about England? England was a different situation. Here's the thing. Calvin had really nothing to do with anything under Edward's reign. He really didn't get involved with the fights under Mary either. He was consulted at one point, but that was it. But surprisingly, when Elizabeth I comes to the throne in England, suddenly Calvin's name is dragged through the mud. At one point, Calvin sends a man who had been his secretary up to serve a French-speaking church in London, serving refugees there who had fled to England. And this man writes back and he says, uh, actually, Calvin, your name right now is not the best one to use. And Calvin was just shocked by this. He had nothing to do with many of these things. Well, what happened? Well, when Knox came to Geneva, he had a private meeting with Calvin where he asked Calvin if he believed that a woman could be the rightful monarch over a country. Now, this is a leading question because Knox already believes that this is not the case. He's opposed to female rule in the political order. And Calvin actually said that while he could see some of what Knox was saying, he actually rebuked some of it. In fact, he rebuked the core of it. He pointed out places in scriptures where there was a female monarch over Israel, and he cited verses here and there, and he said, look, in scripture, this is not condemned. The political order is the political order. Well, sure enough, Knox didn't listen. Knox carried on his own views. And in 1558, he published one of the most legendary mistimed books ever. There was a book called On the Monstrous Regiment of Women. And you have to understand what this book is intending. Knox, again, is pushing, 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 trying to find a way to say, if the person ruling a country is a Catholic and they're persecuting us, well, we can take up arms and fight them. The problem is, is no other Protestant at this point really agreed with him, certainly not in the Reformed world. And so what he does is the door is closed to outright rebellion, so he goes to the window. He argues that a woman has no right to rule, and therefore overthrowing a female monarch is just fine and dandy. The problem, though, is the book was published in English, it was printed in Geneva, though it didn't list itself as having come from Geneva. Well, the problem is, of course, is Calvin doesn't read or write or speak English. So he would have had no idea what this book was all about. Well, sure enough, within a matter of months of Knox publishing this book, saying that a woman had no right to rule, suddenly Elizabeth I comes to the throne. The daughter of Anne Boleyn, in some ways the embodiment of the English Reformation herself, and she was a committed Protestant. Now, people have doubted this, and it's really a stretch to say that she is some sort of conservative, quasi-Catholic. She is funding, for example, the Huguenots' War in their attempt to overthrow the French crown. She's also funding, from time to time, the Dutch Revolt, as Dutch Calvinists are seeking to overthrow their superiors. Everyone appointed to a bishopric under Elizabeth is devoutly Protestant. Not only that, but they're reformed. They're more like Bootser, and frankly, they're more like Calvin. The problem, though, is because Knox had published this work, now Calvin was associated with this anti-women movement, and Elizabeth was incensed. She herself had a weak claim to the throne. She could easily have been overthrown. In fact, much of the reason why Elizabeth never marries in her lifetime is due to the enormous complexity of the fact that in the 16th century, a woman who marries gives all of her authority, money, and power to the man. So if she marries, she essentially gives the crown and the authority of the kingdom over to that man. And so she becomes the virgin queen. Well, Elizabeth will not have any of this talk about the lack of biblical foundations for women ruling in the political order. In many ways, this is why Knox ends up back in Scotland, 
he is not coming back to England as long as Elizabeth is on the throne. And, sure enough, Calvin's name is dragged in. So, for example, Matthew Parker, the first Archbishop of Canterbury who was appointed after Elizabeth comes to the throne, was, strangely enough, a direct personal disciple of Bootser. He had studied with Bootser when he was in Cambridge. Matthew Parker was reformed. He kept all kinds of connections with Bullinger and others. But when Matthew Parker comes to the throne, he admits in a letter to the Secretary of State, William Cecil, that the problem as he sees it are these troublemaking loudmouth folks that claim the name reformed, but are really nothing more than troublemakers. In the end, what happens under Elizabeth is you have a division, not between high Anglican sort of quasi-Catholic folks and the Calvinists on the one hand, but rather a division over the interpretation of how the reformed world was going to continue in England. Strangely enough, you have, on the one hand, people like Matthew Parker citing Peter Martyr, Bootser, Bullinger, and even Calvin against the more hot-blooded Protestants under Elizabeth who want more change, more in the Noxian form, and vice versa. Those who want more radical change, who are casting aspersions on the conformists, who are doing whatever the Queen says, cite Peter Martyr, Bullinger, Bootser, and Calvin back at people like Matthew Parker. In other words, what happens in England as a result of the ongoing complexity of the English Reformation, and in particular as a result of the Marian exile and the confusion that was cast into the church, is you have the emergence of folks who would eventually become Puritan. They would eventually identify as hostile to the Anglican church, even though they shared not only many, if not all, of the same theological foundations, and even though the same wellspring that was feeding Anglicanism and developing it towards its own identity was the same that was feeding those who were rebelling against that identity and forming their own nonconformist and eventually Puritan stances against the Anglican church. What does all this mean? Well, not surprisingly, Calvin had no idea why all this was happening. And in this case, he has a right. He really is getting attacked for something he didn't even do. And his name is being associated with these radical hot prots who are trying to overthrow and overturn the good establishment that Elizabeth and the other Protestants were intending for the English church. So in the end, what we learn from Calvin's engagement with the English-speaking world is that you're going to actually eventually have two traditions of who Calvin is. And I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but you essentially have, on the one hand, the very positive, affirmative, contextual belief that Calvin is a good guy and that the Reformed faith is the faith that ought to be employed in the English-speaking world. You have the Scottish side, in other words. But on the other hand, the complexities of what happened under Elizabeth and Mary, as well as all the way back to Henry, mean that you have this shading and this differentiation of people that share the same Reformed faith, at least initially, but who by and large consider Calvin and some of his ilk, to be troublemakers. And not surprisingly, there is a genealogy that develops from here of a certain anti-Calvinism or an anti-Calvin stance as a result of this rupture under Elizabeth. And not surprisingly, a lot of the reason why the Reformed faith actually becomes, in the English-speaking world, synonymous with quote-unquote Calvinism is a result of the defenders of Calvin and his name there in London and throughout England. And so, in the end, we can learn from this that the genealogy of influence, whenever it picks up from a place like Geneva or the Swiss regions, and it lands in a different country, it always takes on a different tone and a different focus. In the one country, Calvin and the Reformed faith is embraced almost entirely. In the other, you have a new vocabulary of conformist Reformed folks and the nonconformist or Puritan Reformed folks. And in the end, the shaping of two countries and two different denominational trends when they move to the new world is profound. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to look at Calvin and the execution of Servetus. Mm -hmm.